Good evening. Welcome to the Vampire Book Club. We're just going to let everyone know we're live. Tweet our links. And we're going to be talking about books. I see you in the chat talking about the original version of our book versus the new version. And I'm very interested in this discussion. Oh, thank you for the happy anniversary. It was my anniversary. Yesterday, October 13th was my anniversary, my wedding anniversary. Um, yes, I've been married for eight years. I got married on October 13th, 2013. And yes, happily married. Thank you. An echo, you say. Okay, I'm adjusting my microphone. I have everything else off. So if you're still getting an echo, I'm not sure that I can help that. But if I sound loud enough for you to hear, I will assume that I'm doing all right. I need to turn this off because it is delayed and it is confusing me. All right, there we go. That's better. It's quiet. Do I need to turn it up even louder? My camera has a mind of its own. All right, I hope I sound better now. You may notice that I am looking better because instead of just trying to stream straight from my webcam like usual, I'm actually streaming through OBS this time, which is usually what I do when I'm streaming my desktop. But I thought I didn't have to do that when I was streaming just from my webcam. Surprise, YouTube does not like my webcam and the quality was terrible. So I am doing it from OBS and we look better this time, right? Yes, everyone is happy. <laughs> All right, welcome to the Vampire Book Club. Thank you for joining me. I am Zabaven of the Eventide. I hope we are all here. We are here to talk about vampire books. I started the Vampire Book Club um, a little over a year ago, year and a half ago. At this point, my goodness, we've been going for a while. I started right after COVID started because, you know, we couldn't go outside. It was time to read vampire books. As you can see behind me, I have shelves full of vampire books. This is about half of the vampire books I own. And I need to read them all. And I didn't want to read them alone. So we started the Vampire Book Club to read these books together. And the book we read this month is a book that has been on my to read list since before I even started this book club. And I wanted to read it like way back at the beginning of the book club, but there was an issue. The book in question is Certain Dark Things by the wonderfully talented author, Sylvia Moreno Garcia. And this book was out of print. So when I tried to suggest it for the book club, there was no way for anyone else in the book club to acquire it easily. And I didn't want to read a book together that was difficult for most people to get or expensive for most people to get. Um, that's kind of the hard things that things are a little obscure or self-published. Often those books can be kind of expensive. So I try to stick to the more easier to get titles. But the good news is, is that this book has just come back in print last month and is now easy to find everywhere. So uh, we looked forward to it and the minute it was available, it became our book club read. I didn't even have anyone vote on it. I just decided executive decision. I love this author. I haven't read all of her books, but I've read a few of her other books and I'm always very pleased. I love her as a person. I like her Twitter presence. Um, she talks about author stuff and politics sometimes on Twitter. She's very cool on Twitter. Um, she has a Patreon for a short story magazine that she 
runs or co-runs edits she's the editor that's the word and um i support that patreon it's good stuff and i have always wanted to read this book because it is her vampire book it's her only vampire book and as we discussed last time this is a gritty noir murder not murder mystery but murder fantastic vampire book set in an alternate present of Mexico City and the thing that is alternate about the present is that it's uh vampires are normalized vampires have existed in this world forever but openly as far as humans know since the 1970s and also Things are genetically modified sometimes. Um, one of the first things we find out about is that the main vampire character, Otto, has a genetically modified Doberman dog. So it's a lot bigger and meaner and smarter than a regular Doberman dog and also has a really cool like neon glow-in-the-dark tattoo. The author described this book as Daft Punk meets Dracula. And the stuff with the genetic engineering and like the neon glowing tattoos and stuff, I thought there would be a lot more of that in the book, but there really wasn't. Um, a lot of it was just a really realistic depiction of the grittiness of Mexico City. And coincidentally, I happen to be taking a class right now about uh, depictions of death. Um, you see this book behind me, Death, the Graveside Companion. That's the textbook for the class I'm taking and um, the instructor for the class had us watch a documentary on the cult of Santa Muerte in Mexico, specifically Mexico City. And I was watching this documentary earlier this week, depicting the exact same streets and people and, you know, kind of society that this book was set in. So it was an excellent companion watch to go with uh, the book, because even though that book's or that documentary is not about vampires or anything. It was still like the kind of people that you were encountering in this book were the same kind of people that you were seeing in the in the documentary. And I think it's public to watch documentary. It's called Saint Death and it's on Vimeo. You could just look it up. So um, one of the things that exists in real Mexico that the author used in this book is a lot of drug trade, uh, drug cartels, warring gangs that are involved in different drug distribution. Um, and in this world, vampires exist everywhere. Uh, well, they were found out in the 70s and most countries sort of banished them. So they went to countries with more lax laws, such as Mexico, amongst other countries. So even though there were native Mexican vampires, which were based on Aztec legends, which our main character, Adel, is one of those ancient Aztec vampires, though she's young, she's only 23 years old, but her people are ancient. Um, the other kinds of vampires from all over the world, you have like the classic Transylvanian vampires, you have a lot of different variations on movie trope vampires, you have Chinese hopping vampires, you have African mythology vampires. They've all come to Mexico and they have mostly integrated like in the northern part of Mexico and Mexico City is a vampire free zone. So this book is set in Mexico City where no vampires are allowed and supposedly no vampires live, not even in a secret vampire underworld. There are just absolutely no vampires in Mexico City and the local gangs and drug runners in Mexico City make sure that they keep the vampires out of their city because uh, the gangs are the real bosses. The cops don't have that much power. It's actually the gangs that, like, you know, run things. And our main character, Otto, is one of the uh, Aztec brand of vampires, which is based on birds. So instead of being like a classic Transylvanian vampire, she has these bird powers. She doesn't bite with fangs. Um, she uses like bird talons. When she feeds, she has a stinger that comes out of her mouth, kind of like the Filipino vampire legends, but um, that you saw. We talked about when we were talking about the strain, the Guillermo de Toro book, they use the Filipino Atwong vampire with the stinger that comes out of the mouth. But she has the same thing from the Aztec legends. Um, she develops feathers, she kind of turns really bird-like, and she has wings that she can produce from nothing. Um, 
and when she's not feeding she kind of just looks like a normal human person except she's got kind of weird eyes so she can mostly blend in it's okay she can go out in the daytime but it's kind of hard so she prefers not to uh, she needs blood to survive she can't really eat human food but she can have sugar so when she's like craving blood but can't get it she'll just eat a bunch of sugar or drink tea with a lot of sugar speaking of drinking i was drinking the last of my apple spice vodka which i only had this much left so i had to finish it off um and i've got my skull ice cube but i was trying to think of what drink would go with this book and in the book they drink a lot of tequila of course because mexico but a lot of the vampires will drink alcohol as a way to try to sate their bloodlust. doesn't really work, but it's the closest possible thing. But they drink a lot of vodka, so I'm going to be drinking tonight my Crystal Head Vodka. I thought the skull was appropriate, even though this is not Mexican vodka. It's just, you know, it's got that vibe, Santa Morte. And it's rainbow, colorful. This was my Pride Month bottle, but, you know, I'm actually going to be drinking now. You can see I haven't had any yet. Oh, my skull-shaped ice cube. This vodka is too good to mix. You drink it straight on ice. That is my recommendation. So, Adel has come to Mexico City. Even though vampires are banned from Mexico City uh, because she is on the run. She is running away from her troubled past. And she's being pursued by people who want her. Um, and you find out this whole story throughout the course of the novel. But the basic backstory is that her people, her vampire people the bird Aztec vampires who you know in ancient Aztec days did the whole like blood sacrifice thing that you see in all the ancient legends um, and they were part of that they ran the drug trade up in the north of Mexico um, but these other vampires from Europe had come in and they're trying to take over so now we've got these more like traditional European vampires um, they the they're basically like Dracula Transylvanian style except they have like shark teeth. So instead of just like two fangs, it's like a whole maw of shark teeth. Um, and they're called the Necros. And they come in and they're trying to take over the drug trade. So there's a drug war between her family and the Necros family. And um, they kill her mom. Her mom's like the head of the vampires, of her kind of vampires. And um, Adel's sister, her big sister, is now in charge, and she doesn't want revenge, but Adel and the rest of the family do. So Adel says, um, you know, screw my sister, and she goes out and she gets revenge, and she kills some of them, and then they come back and kill some more of them, and it's like a big old war. Her sister dies, everyone dies, she loses her life, so Adel flees. She's the only one who survives. She escapes with her trusty Doberman Quali, and they run down to Mexico City where she hopes she can escape because, you know, vampires aren't allowed in there. So no one will look for her there. So people are chasing her. Um, the Necros sent their goons, which are all human. They're called Renfields, the human goons of the vampires. Um, but one of the Necros came along with them, the son of the main Necros guy, whose name is Nick. And he's just a huge asshole. He's like this bratty, entitled, he's not a teenager, but he's very young. Just like, I'm going to prove that I'm tough shit and I'm going to go catch this girl that we're having our drug war with. And he just wants to come down and just like be the boss. And he doesn't respect the human goons who are there. The main human goon is Rodrigo and he's like this older man and he's very savvy. And he's just like, I'm so sick of this kid. I can't stand so Adel is in Mexico City. She's trying to blend in. She's like, she's looking for an old friend of her mom's who can kind of help her. But she's, she's hungry. She needs blood. She needs help. She doesn't know how to go about finding this old friend of her mom's. So she meets this human kid. Um, and this human kid is actually the first character we meet in the book. His name is Domingo. He is 17 years old and he's a street kid. Um, he is homeless well he lives in a subway tunnel that he's got like his this sweet pad in the subway tunnels um and he has this crush on her because he's seen her around so one day he sees her around again and he, of course he notices her because she's got this dog with the glowing tattoo and like you can't forget this really hot chick with this glowing dog and he finally talks to her and she's very aloof she's very cold she's very like you know a human child i'm not interested in you She's 23, but she's still very, like, she's a snobby, spoiled, rich drug lord's daughter, you know. 
and now she's finally on her own for the first time. So Domingo sort of ingratiates himself to her. He's a very charming kid. He's a nice guy. He doesn't do drugs. He doesn't really, like, get involved in anything too sinister. He used to be involved in sinister stuff, and he didn't like it, so he left to go become a garbage picker, and now he's working for a garbage picker guy, a rag and bone man. And he's got a happier life. He's really into comic books, so he's read a lot about vampires, and he thinks he's got it figured out. So Otto invites him home so she can drink his blood, and then she's like, here's some money, be gone. But of course he doesn't want to be gone, because he's got this huge crush on her. So he comes back. She's like, why are you coming back? Why are you back? And of course, you know, they sort of hit it off. They become friends. And um, she decides to make him her Renfield, except they have a different word for it in Aztec. Um, but basically, he's now her Renfield. Um, so her human servant. So she sends Domingo off to find the person she's looking for. And she says, to find this person who's going to help me get like a fake passport and stuff to get out of Mexico so I can go down to Guatemala and Brazil. She sends him to another vampire who lives in Mexico City. And no vampires are supposed to live in Mexico City. But this vampire has been there since the before times. He's very old and he's like, they can't kick me out. So he's been living there secretly this whole time. Not, you know, causing any problems. He's cool. And his type of vampire is called a revenant. And this revenant type of vampire is kind of also based on Dracula. But like, not the young, hot, angry Dracula. But like the old, shambling, shuffling Dracula. Oh, thank you, Jamie Reynolds, for the dollar forty-nine. I don't know what A means. Is that Austria, Australia, Afghanistan? I don't know, but thank you. Um, and uh, his name is Bernardino, and he, uh, the revenants, they're very old and hideous looking. They have hunchbacks, but if they drink some blood, they sort of start looking young again. But they don't really need blood. They more like need life force. So they're like touch a victim and kind of just like suck their life out and it feels like burning. And um, so Domingo goes to this guy and he says, you know, you were friends with Otto's mother. You got to help her. And the guy's like, Otto's not her mother. Why do I got to help her? And he doesn't want to help her. But, you know, he eventually does. And there's a lot of very reluctant alliances in this book. So he gives Domingo the name of the lady who can help with the passport. So Domingo's got that. And meanwhile, um, the kid Nick, the Necros vampire, and Rodrigo, he's there in town. They're looking for Otto. They've traced her there. But Nick is very hungry. He doesn't like eating bottled blood. He's, like, starving. So he goes out and he kills a girl at a club. He just, like, eats her face. Uh, very gory, very brutal. He's very um, misogynistic. He's just, like, this total asshole of a character. And so uh, this girl is left in an alley, so the cops start investigating this murder. So we have our main detective cop. Her name is Anna. Um, she's very jaded cop. She, she thought she could join the police force and clean up the corruption in Mexico, but now she's just realized that it's a boys club and they'll never like give her respect. And her entire force and her captain are just terrible to her all the time. And she used to work in a vampire place or she got a reputation as a vampire killer, but she didn't want that anymore. So she came to Mexico City so she wouldn't have to deal with vampires. And now there's a vampire murder. And she's got a 17-year-old daughter, and she just wants to keep her daughter safe. And that's her motivation. Um, so she's on this case, and she's really not enjoying it. But she's just like, they're not even going to let me, like, close this case. They're just going to say, do the paperwork. But um, there's a street gang, human street gang, called Deep Crimson. And Deep Crimson is like, we don't like vampires on our turf. Mexico City is a vampire free zone so they find Anna detective Anna and they're like if you give us information we'll give you information and we can kill these vampires it's an affront it's like an insult to our street gang that these vampires are here and we really want revenge and Anna's like I too also want the vampires out of here but if I work with the street gang then I'm a corrupt cop but all the cops are already corrupt anyway and how do I beat the system I don't know I just want to keep my daughter safe so that's her conundrum Excuse me one moment. I need to blow my nose.
Sometimes when I talk a lot, I get like kind of congested. And I get that feeling like you have to blow your nose, but then you try and nothing happens. I don't know. Am I weird? Ooh, this is good vodka. I know I'm talking so much, I'm not even enjoying my vodka. Okay. So we got our main players here. We, like we got Anna, the, the disgruntled detective. We've got Otto, the vampire on the run. We've got Domingo, her 17-year-old, you know, blood bag. We've got Nick, the horrible, awful douchebag vampire who's chasing her. And we got the dog, Quali, who's, you know, a total sweetheart. Because Quali is not just, like, a good dog, but of course she is a good dog. Uh, Quali also is, like, a good fighter. So whenever Anna's in trouble, Quali, like, kills people for her. A good dog. Um, so, uh... Uh, Otto and Domingo go to find the passport lady and the passport lady is also like I don't want to work for you and they very reluctantly convince her to like giving them the passports and stuff and she's like I'm gonna need time so they're like okay we gotta lay low we gotta make sure that we like last until she gets the paperwork and in the meantime the street gang Deep Crimson their spokesperson is this girl Kika she's just like this very perky gangbanger um, who's always wearing like a red go-go dress is working with Anna and so they tip between Anna's information and Kika's information they find out where Otto lives because um, sanitation crews sweep through the city often because um, not only are they making sure there are no vampires there but there is a like gen genetically modified disease that goes around that makes people just kind of slowly decay and, and the people who have this disease are called chronics and people think like oh vampires started this disease people think like oh humans made this disease to try to get rid of vampires and unleashed it on their own kind and brought this upon themselves but it's like this horrible disease where people are just sort of like rotting into zombies and um, these cronags are always shuffling around so these sanitation sweeps are always going through town so that's how they find out where Otto is living <laughs> meanwhile Domingo has this huge crush on Otto he really like wants in her pants but he's also very respectful about it and he's like oh does that make me a perv i don't know you know and we're finding out more about Otto's backstory and domingo's backstory and um so they stage an attack the gang and anna so the the human gang and anna find out where Otto's living and they attack them as they're coming out of the apartment and there's a big old fight scene the dog kills a bunch of people Otto kills some people after she, she's like gone out and gotten a gun and um, they escape but Otto gets shot with silver nitrate darts and silver is makes like vampires have an allergic reaction so she needs help she's sort of like sick um, from these silver nitrate darts going into apoplectic shock so Domingo takes her back to his subway house and he goes to get one of his old friends and we learn that Domingo used to work for the street gang guy called the Jackal. And the Jackal would like make kids sell candy or wash cars and do things and then like take a cut of their proceeds. But he was like an asshole to Domingo because he wanted Domingo's girlfriend and he like really abused and humiliated Domingo and stole his girlfriend. So now the Jackal has Domingo's girlfriend. Um, but the Jackal also do runs like dog fighting rings and he has a vet who works on his dogs who's also one of Domingo's friends. So Domingo goes and he gets this friend, uh, this vet friend and he's like, you're the closest thing I know to a doctor. Come look at my sick vampire friend. And he does, but the vet friend is like, oh no, I don't want to do this. So Domingo has to threaten him to make him do it. It's all very dramatic. Isn't it great how my camera follows me everywhere? I love it. No, I don't. Nobody wants to see me blow my nose. Everybody blows their nose. Um, so, uh, well, Domingo and Otto are getting patched up with this friend. He has to take them back to the warehouse where the dog fighting ring is because that's where all his medical supplies are. So they go there. And he, he patches Otto up and she's like very sick and she's sort of like, you know, recovering. Um, 
But then he betrays him. He calls the jackal and he's like, hey, I caught a vampire. And we know there's people looking for this vampire because Rodrigo and Nick had like put out word to all the street gangs that like, yes, if you see this girl, call us big reward. So they betray them. So they put Otto and the dog and Domingo in a cage. No, but Otto and Domingo in a cage and they take the dog because they're like, we could use this dog in our dog fighting rings. And the poor dog, she is such a good dog. He, I'm, I'm not sure on the dog's gender, but you know, name is Quali. Um, and Otto wakes up and she's like, what's going on? And Domingo's like, we're caught, you know. Um, and she's like too sick. She can't really move. She's very weak. Um, she doesn't have her gun anymore. She's still got a knife. And um, then the jackal comes in and he's got um, Domingo's ex-girlfriend with him just like flaunting it. And he's like gloating and he's like, oh, you know, Nick and Rodrigo are showing up and we're going to go greet them. Um, but Otto gets out of the cage. She escapes. She's still a vampire. She's still really badass. Meanwhile, she's been having this whole, like, internal dilemma about the fact that she was, like, a spoiled princess drug lord's daughter who never had to work a day in her life. But her people, these Aztec vampires, were warrior people. Her name means water. But she's supposed to be, like, the water of war. And she keeps hearing her dead big sister's voice in her head, mocking her for not being strong, for not being a warrior. And, like, she wants to be a warrior, but, like, she's a pampered princess. So she's, like, trying to come to terms between I'm not good enough versus, like, yeah, I am a badass. So there's a big old fight scene. She kills the goons. She starts drinking Domingo's ex-girlfriend's blood, but Domingo's like, don't hurt her, you know, because he's a good guy. Um, so Otto spares the girl. Her name is Belan. She gets away, which I really appreciated. Thank you. Um, but then Nick and Rodrigo come in with all of their goons, and there's a big old fight scene, guns, bullets, uh, darts. They have electric tasers, which work a lot better on vampires than bullets, so they're all, everyone's getting shocked. She and Nick finally face off. We find out that Nick is obsessed with her because... Not only did, like, she kill some of his family, he killed some of her family. It's a, like, blood grudge. But once upon a time, back before all that, he saw her at a club one day and tried to hit on her, and she rejected him. So he's been obsessed with her ever since. So he doesn't just want to kill her, which is what his dad, the drug lord, wants. Um, he wants to, like, bring her back and own her and make her his whore and, like, torture her for a hundred years. He's got, like, big big obsession plans like every time he kills a human girl or like drinks blood or something he like imagines it's Otto he's like really obsessed with her um so they have a big old fight uh she gets beat up really bad he bites her hand with his shark teeth she shoots off half of his face you know they're vampires they heal quickly um but she and Domingo and the dog get away um tons of people are dead this is the same night as tons of people died outside her apartment complex when um you know Anna plus the deep crimson gang attacked so they escape they don't know where to go her hand is now infected with the disease that the necros vampires infect with so they go back to the revenant vampire Bernardino go back to his house even though she's like he's probably gonna just kill us but you know we're gonna die anyway so she goes back there and he's like get out of my house I don't want to help you but then he very reluctantly agrees to help them so he helps them um he uses his revenant powers of transferring life force to help heal her they say we're gonna have to chop off your hand otherwise you know the disease is gonna spread so they amputate her hand but her type of vampire can regrow limbs like lizards and um so they kind of chill at his house recovering for a while and uh the old revenant vampire talks to domingo and he's like you're just a lowly human and you're in love with her and she's never gonna want you and it would be degrading to her if she was to want you and how dare you but also kind of follow your heart like he gives this very mixed message and domingo and Otto eventually end up hooking up this sort of brewing romance between them comes to a head they have sex He's 17, she's 23. It's weird. Uh, the power dynamics are very off. This whole book is very dark. Um, 
but he is very much like into her and he's a very sweet guy and slowly her hand is regrowing she she gets like half a hand and they go back and they meet the passport lady and she she was going to drive them out of the country with these passports but she's like ever since that whole giant vampire warehouse fight that you had a few nights ago nobody can get out of the country now so no i'm not going to drive you out bye good luck um gives them the passport sleeves and they're like well now how are we going to get out of mexico city much less the country and Domingo tells them, well, you don't have to go past the border. I'm a garbage picker. I know the dumps. If you go to the dump, you can go over the, like, dump moat and get out of the city easily for someone who knows the dumps. And they're like, wow, you're really useful after all. So um, they got a plan. Um, and they're like, okay, once we get past the dump moat, we can't drive to Guatemala. So we're going to need someone to take us through the jungles to Guatemala. And Bernardino's like, well, I know a guy. So they go see this guy he knows, which is like a former Renfield. He's another human, like an older man. And he's like, I really don't want to help you, Luen. But then he eventually reluctantly agrees, which <laughs> you notice a pattern in this book. They all eventually reluctantly agree. Teamwork. You know, and it's not even like money because Otto just has like infinite money. Apparently, she just keeps throwing money around to get whatever she wants. And he's like, but I'm going to need two days to get ready. So they go back to Berndino's crumbling mansion and just like hang out in this gothic mansion. Meanwhile, Anna, the detective and the deep crimson game, Kika, the like go go dress deep crimson girl, um, are trying to figure out where they are and what's going on and Anna remembers this former um CI who's like there's still a vampire in Mexico City and he lives on this street and she's like I'm gonna call that guy and see if like maybe he's on this street because she heard oh a taxi driver came in who Otto had been like take me to this street and she forced him to go and so um she remembers that so she connects the dots and she uh, calls in the, the guy and she, well, she goes to his tea house and like intimidates him into giving her information. So she figures out where they are. But just before she can go tell the Deep Crimson Gang where they are so they can go kill the vampires, Nick and Rodrigo catch up to her. And Nick is the kind of vampire that can like mind control humans. So he bites Anna, the, the cop who doesn't want to be corrupt, and he mind controls her. And he's like, tell me where Otto is. So now Anna is in mind control of Nick, which is very, very sad. I was very disappointed about that. Wow, my skull ice cube melted already. Oh, fuck a water. So the vampires spring the attack. Well, the one vampire and his goons, the, the necros Nick and his goons spring the attack on Bernardino's mansion and get the drop on them, but Otto and Bernardino and Domingo and the dog fight back. They get away. Anna, the cop, has a moment where she's released from Nick's hold and she tries to do the right thing, but then Nick gets his hold back and this is like this moment. Um, they kill a few of the goons. They get away. They're running through the streets. They're trying to get to the garbage dump so they can get across, and, you know. So then we get to our big garbage dump final boss fight right so they get there um it's like a big gun shootout thing and uh through this fight um domingo they make domingo go and hide even though he really doesn't want to he wants to hide so the domingo and the dog go and hide and bernardino and um Otto are fighting and anna is under mind control so she's fighting at nick's side and it comes down to nick versus anna and you know, it's, it's, Otto is really beat up. She's like got half a hand. She's so sick. She's so tired. She hasn't had blood. She's like really down in her resources. And even though she's a pampered princess, I get the feeling like if she was at full capacity, she would have totally kicked Nick's ass because she's a warrior, Aztec vampire and a badass. But it's a fight. Oh, thank you, Lindsay P for the four ninety nine. Thank you so much. Um, the fight ends with uh, Anna almost Anna almost escapes the mind control and that throws Nick off for a moment enough. 
I mean, Nick is already like, Bernardino has attacked all the human people, but Nick gets to jump on Bernardino and stakes him with this giant, like, rebar thing. Um, but Anna breaks the mind control, and Nick's distracted enough for Otto to get him, and then um, they're struggling, and they're fighting, and it comes down to the wire, but um, Domingo has pulled the rebar out of Bernardino because he got found out where he was hiding and the dog got shot, which was very sad. And he comes out and he smacks Nick with that. And that's enough for Bernardino to rise up from. And then he comes and he like puts his hands on Nick and sucks out his life force and Nick crumbles into dust. And everyone's like, yes, the asshole douchebag is finally vanquished. And uh, they win the fight at the end of the time. Oh, uh, Anna, out of her mind control, almost tries to shoot Nick, and Nick's like, oh no, mind control, back, and he makes Anna shoot herself, and she dies. And it's very sad, because I was really rooting for Anna. I wanted her to get away. I wanted her to save her daughter. But she... She, she died. And I don't know what's going to happen to her daughter now. The 17-year-old the daughter that she kept being like, any one of these kids could be my daughter anytime. I gotta get out of here. We're gonna move to Cuba, and we're gonna save my daughter. Anna's dead. Nick is dead. Rodrigo died because um, Bernardino got Rodrigo. Rodri I kind of like Rodrigo, even though he was like a bad guy. He was like, I, I liked him. I was hoping he'd just be like, screw you guys, I'm going home. But no, he died. Uh, yeah, um, everyone died. Like, the only people left at the end are Bernardino, Otto, and Domingo. You know, as far as we know, all the guys of from Domingo's past, all the gang guys, the jackals dead, all of those people are dead. Balin did get away, the girlfriend, so you know, there's hope for her. Um, so they go across the garbage dump, they go across the moat. Um, Bernardino is like, my work here is done, and he goes back home to his mansion. Um, they get to the taxi cab that's going to take them away. Um, it's just Otto and Domingo now. And Otto sort of had like a come to Jesus moment and she's like, I could take Domingo with me. I love him. He loves me. We're in love. This has gotten romantic even though it's beneath me and I'm a vampire and I shouldn't be in love with a human. But you know what? I am and he clearly loves me even though he knows it's dangerous and he would give his life for me and he just almost did. But he deserves better than me. So she rejects him. She tells him to leave. And it's very sad. It's very bittersweet. But it is for the best. She sends Domingo back. She's like, here's some money. Go start a new life for yourself. I'll give you more money later once I'm free. I'm no good for you. And she leaves on her own. And Domingo, like, sees in her eyes that she loves him and she's doing this out of love. And he's very sad. He's like, no, let me come with you. But no, she won't let him. Yes, she set him free. So she drives off into the night. And Domingo goes back into the, the junkyard. And he finds the dog still alive. Yay! Quali lives. The dog lives. So now uh, Domingo didn't get the girl, but he got the dog. And you know what? His ex-girlfriend survived. She's out there still. And the jackal's dead. So maybe they can get back together and he can have like a normal human romance and be like happy in his life with the money Otto's going to send him. So yeah, it's a bittersweet ending. Otto escapes to Guatemala. She goes off into the jungles. Who knows what her future will hold? Because her whole life is gone. And she doesn't even have her dog anymore. Her, like, guardian dog. Yeah. Bittersweet ending, but very deep. Very meaningful. I really enjoyed this book. It was exciting. It was fun. I finished it very quickly. It had a lot of, like, deep thoughts about vampires. I like the fact that there were... 10, perhaps 12, different types of vampire species that exist. Vampires were not humans turned into vampires. Vampires are a different species and subspecies that have always existed. Um, so, you know, some of your vampire lore that you know is right, some is not. The author says that she was inspired a lot by, like, Mexican vampire cinema. The author is a Mexican person who's Canadian, so she's Mexican-Canadian, um, but she's a lot of close ties to Mexico, and she writes a lot of her books are based in Mexico. <sighs> and that's the book. I'm going to blow my nose again, because you know how it goes. The 
this camera is just sinister. Follow me back, camera. We're over here now. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, camera. All right. That was Certain Dark Things, which um, there were a couple passages. You know, when we talk about, like, what do the vampires mean and what do they represent? Um, Bernardino has this big speech about how vampires are their hunger that's all they are they cannot love even if they do fall in love with a human it doesn't really mean anything because at the end of the day all a vampire is is its hunger and he says it's no surprise when you consider it we've been surviving for a very long time against a rather cunning and adaptable foe humans are nothing if not adaptable i can't claim the same for us vampires though we are persistent yet we make it through Despite being outnumbered by your folk, humans, despite times that change too quickly because of that undeniable truth, in, de in the end, we are always our hunger. And when you think of in the terms of like Mexico City vampires, the climate in Mexico City, social climate, but also physical climate, it's very hot down there, just being so hungry for power you know the fact that all the vampires eventually became involved in the drug trade in these illegal trades because it was you know you have to be on top otherwise you're gonna be on the bottom you get knocked down like if you aren't on top you're fighting to be on top and it's always a war always a war um and it's just you know i've don't I'm not in a position to be a person to comment on culture in Mexico but watch that documentary I, I told you about you can see a lot of what it's like down there and you know this author absolutely is in a position to comment on that so using vampires as a metaphor for the kind of power struggle that exists in that social political climate I thought was really interesting Also, the title of Certain Dark Things, I um, coincidentally saw a Tumblr post with a quote from a poem that had the phrase Certain Dark Things. And I was like, oh, I wonder if that poem is where the author got the title for this book from. So I looked up that poem and now I'm 100% sure that the author was inspired by this poem. It's a Spanish poem, not by a Mexican author, but by a Chilean author called Pablo Neruda. It's called... 100 love sonnets and it's of his 100 love sonnets it's number uh 18 or 17 it's in roman numerals um but l let me read the poem to you and talk about why i suspect the author used this poem to name her book even though she's never said this and i haven't asked it's a very short poem i will read you a poem now I don't love you as if you were a rose of salt, topaz, or arrow of carnations that propagate fire. I love you as one loves certain dark things, secretly, between the shadow and the soul. I love you as the plant that doesn't bloom but carries the light of those flowers hidden within itself. And thanks to your love, the tight aroma that arose from the earth lives dimly in my body. I love you without knowing how or when or from where. I love you directly without problems or pride. I love you like this because I don't know any other way to love, except in this form in which I am not, nor are you, so close that your hand upon my chest is mine, so close that your eyes close with my dreams. And in this book, when Domingo touches Otto after she's exchanged blood with him, he shares her dreams. He sees her memories of, you know, the horrible things that happened to her and her family. And I think that's just too coincidental of a connection for this poem to have not inspired this book. So that's my suspicion. And I think it's just a beautiful poem. The translation I'm reading it's just one of many translations of this poem that you can find online. It was originally in Spanish, which I'm sure is how this author must have read it. But the love story between Domingo and Otto, 
originally when I was reading the book, I wasn't really rooting for this love story because I'm always for like, let's have really complex, dynamic, you know, platonic friendships where there's mutual pining but don't ever be realized because that's like the inner gothic in me, right? Because that's a very gothic feeling. And of course, they do have their sex scene. They do get together. The fact that she's 23 and he's 17 was kind of weird. But I'm like, they're vampires. What does age even matter? She's going to live to be 100. 23 for her is probably 16 in normie years, right? So I thought that was pretty cool. The This poem is very romantic and very full of love, which I didn't really talk about the romance story that much when I was summarizing the book. But there is that romance undercurrent to the book which this poem really connects to which i thought was pretty cool all right um i'm going to scroll up and read the chat and see if you had any questions that you want me to answer this is also now your chance to ask me questions about this book or share your thoughts about this book that you want me to read aloud and i can share to other people um, thank you to everyone in the Discord server who has been discussing this book with us for the past month and sharing your thoughts. It's always really cool. Most of the people in this book club come to the live streams, but there are a few in the Discord server who chat actively about the book as they're reading it, which is always very fun. You can join the book club by joining the Discord server. The link is in the description of this video. Chat with us. Yeah, the um, Cronag disease, Vicky S says, I feel like this disease was really interesting, but then it only came up once. I was a little disappointed with that too. Um, also, the fact that the whole like genetically modified dogs thing wasn't more a part of the active world we were seeing. Like these were very cool world building details, but they didn't show up in the story itself very much. Like we didn't run into any Cronags who are the diseased people. We didn't run into any more genetically modified things. The fact that this was sort of like a sci-fi alternate present didn't factor that much into it. And I would have liked to see a lot more of that, especially since the author called the book Daft Punk meets Dracula. And that Daft Punk aspect of it wasn't there throughout. I feel like if this was a movie, or TV show, we would have seen a lot more of that in the visual language of the cinematic storytelling. But in the book itself, it wasn't on the page. So we were just sort of expected to imagine it in ourselves. And I'm not very good at that. So I lost that thread. I read the original version of this book. And like I said, the book was released. And the new release version, I have been told by you, has additional paragraphs that describe more stuff. Um, you didn't mention this, but I'm wondering if there is more of that world building, if there is more of that like Daft Punk neon, like cyberpunkness to it. That would be cool. Oh, someone mentioned uh, Robert Danny says, for those curious about the references to Germain Robles' vampire movies, a couple of his films are on the free streaming services Tubi and Pluto TV. So the book is dedicated to the real life actor Germain Robles, who was a famous vampire actor of Mexican cinema. So like the Bela Lugosi of Mexico. And um, not in this version, but in the new version, the author describes how she dedicated this book to the actor because he inspired her love of vampires so much. And he even comes up in this book when they're talking about like vampire lore and vampire cinematic history. And she really wanted, she was like a big fan of his and she really wanted to send the book to him and like give it to him 
but then he died like right before it came out and it was very upsetting for her that's not in this book version I read but in the author's note to the new version which um, someone on my discord shared with us so we could all read it that was very interesting to me So Vicky S. says there's no more sci-fi additions to the new version, just more detail when Otto's getting her hand amputated and some more insight into Otto's feelings and thoughts throughout. See, I would have liked to read that. I'd love to have the new version. I'm very, I feel very special that I have the original version because it is so rare. If you try to buy this online, it goes for like hundreds of dollars now. Oh, this is like my nest egg. This will put my children through college, right? Um, yeah, I'm never selling this. But the new version has that cool cover which i used in the thumbnail for this video which is a lot more like neon cyberpunk it also has recipes in the back which this version does not this version has a glossary which was really cool because it gave a lot more insight into the world building of the like 10 different types of vampires that exist if you do well you know and um that was cool but no recipes i want to know what those recipes are Why do I think the author has so many species of vampires? I wasn't sure what metaphor she was making. I think because there are so many vampire lore things that exist all around the world. Um, so the idea of this book is that vampires have always existed and some of the lore got it right. And it's mentioned in the book that not every country in the world has vampire lore, but a lot do. Like you look at things like a supernatural creature and you're like well you know this one culture invented this creature so of course it's made up of course it's not real it's just a ghost story but if another culture all the way across the world made up the same exact creature is that too coincidental to be real maybe this supernatural creature has some basis in reality if two totally distinct cultures made it up right so there is vampire lore or rather the dead coming back and consuming the living lore in multiple cultures around the world in africa in asia in europe in central america you know this exists the world over and i think the author was trying to use that as sort of like a scientific proof of the idea of vampires being a separate species of hominid that evolved naturally alongside homo sapiens and i thought that was pretty cool it added to the sci-fi aspect it added to the science aspect even though it was very magical like you know she can sprout wings out of nothing from her back you know it takes a lot of energy for her to do that it's very fantastical but since she was using the aztec lore and the aztec legends of mexico to make this a very Mexican book, incorporating the other vampire lores from other countries helped, I think, bolster that and justify that because you shouldn't have to justify it, right? But as a, you know, she's not American, she's Canadian, but it's a very similar publishing marketplace, Canada and America. And this was published by an American publishing company anyway. Um, to write something that's like, this is based on Mexican folklore. Of America is not going to validate that the same way they will European folklore. It's just a fact. And if you're like, well, Mexican folklore is just as valid as every other world folklore, it helps. You know, it sort of pushes that. And this author has often talked about the struggles that um, authors of color face in the marketplace and you know just marginalized authors in general you should follow her on twitter she's very interesting to follow she's a very cool person um so you know it's, it's something she shouldn't have had to do but i can see why she did and considering this was also one of her earlier novels like her more recent novels also very cool um but back in the early beginnings but also i think it's really cool like to look at other cultures like she didn't explore the chinese and african vampires but she mentioned them she gave them props good for her uh 
uh, Karnstein says that the author says in the interview that comes with the new version that the different species are a comment on class and colonialism. So yeah, there was a lot of class in this book and colonialism. So the idea that in the 1970s when humans discovered vampires existed and they sort of ousted vampires from all their countries, the European vampires, the Necros and the Revenants and all the others that were your classic like Transylvanian Dracula types, just went to other countries and just took over, you know, to, went to where these Aztec vampires had been existing for thousands and thousands of years before the even the Hispanic colonialization that happened in the, you know, 13, 1400s. And just came in and were like, oh, we're the bosses now. We're taking over. Oh, the recipes in the back are drink recipes? Yeah, I definitely want to get the new version of this book as well, just so I can, like, get all this neat content, you know? Tips for African vampire legends. They're harder to find. I know of them in the Middle East, Eurasia, East Asia, South Asia, Europe, and North and South America, but not so many in Africa. Well, I'll tell you what's in here. If you're interested in this, this is this fictional book's interpretation of the African vampire legends, but it's based on what research the author did. So let me tell you from the glossary in the back, which is wonderful. So the Obaifo, native to Western Africa, they glow in the dark and this property might have been useful for them to find a way to hunt for prey and to attract their prey as their glow is said to be hypnotic, drawing humans to them. The Obaifo can conceal their glow by manipulating the perception of those around them, just like certain marine organisms deploy flaps of skin to hide glow spots. They are not as physically resilient as the Necros and other subspecies, and thus are more vulnerable to attacks. This is a standalone novel. There will be no sequel. Um, but the world that the author created in here is really ripe for exploration. Like, there's a lot more that, you know, you could explore with this. I think, like, it would make a great premise for a TV show where just TV show writers would sort of take this world she built and just come up with new stories and new characters within it. That would be really cool. Um, this book was based off a short story that the author had written, which is how a lot of authors come up with their novels. They'll write a short story and then develop a whole novel out of it based on that premise. What did people think about Anna dying? It seemed a strange choice to me, like not much would change if she wasn't even a character. I think it was a commentary on sort of the like, like this idea of I'm going to have hopes and dreams. I'm going to change the system. I'm going to be the one person who fights back, but it's hopeless and I can't do it and I'm going to fail. And she failed. But it's not a cynical commentary so much as saying like there's no point in trying to change the system. There's no point in trying to stop corruption. Like it's an impossible task to do. It's more just like a commentary on... It's going to take a lot of people like this over and over and over again before we get there. And I don't think Anna's death and her struggle were really just like a tragedy so much as more of like a, a seed to be planted for hope for the future. And I don't think this author is saying that Mexico or Mexico City is a lost cause and it's just going to be a corrupted drug cartel forever. So much as saying that, like, look at the struggle that women like Anna go through. Look how hard they work and how hard they try and how much they care and see where they end up. See where it gets them. Do you see? Do you understand? And showing that fight with its ultimate tragic ending, how much she tried and how much she cared and where it got her in the end. 
to show us so that maybe we might do something. That's, that's what I got from Anna's death, as tragic as it was. That was Certain Dark Things by Sylvia. Sorry, I'm trying to straighten my bat out there. We must have straight bats. Thank you. Sylvia Moreno Garcia. You should read her other books. They're all slightly different. They're all standalones. I love her book Mexican Gothic, which was her, I want to say most recent book, but hasn't she come out with another book since then? Anyway, Mexican Gothic was great. It was the big book of last year. It's the book that kind of eventually put her on the map, even though she's been like around forever. It got great buzz. Um, so Mexican Gothic is like a very classic Gothic novel like Rebecca or The Yellow Wallpaper or even like Wuthering Heights or, you know, Jane Eyre, like that kind of book. But mixed with Lovecraft. So there is a supernatural element. There is like an elder god element and it's very trippy and very cool. Very much like that book. And it's got another spunky female heroine in Mexico doing Mexico things. And we see a very different part of Mexico. We see like a mountainside country region. No vampires though, but there are Lovecraftian elder gods. So, you know. So what are we reading? next time on the Vampire Book Club. Well, I wanted to, I always like to keep variety in the book club. So, you know, if we read something heavier, or something dark, we'll switch to something light or something short or, you know, this was kind of a shorter book. Uh, so I decided we're going to read something humorous. So I have a lot of these books, you know, like Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, where they'll take like a classic novel and insert monsters into it, and Sense and Sensibility and Sea Monsters. So there's a bunch of that with vampires, but I've already read a lot of them. So the only ones I had left that I hadn't read were Wuthering Bites, which is Wuthering Heights with vampires, or My Favorite Fangs, which is The Sound of Music with Vampires. And My Favorite Fangs one. that's what we're reading next. My Favorite Fangs by Alan Goldsher, who is author of Paul is Undead, The British Zombie Invasion. Um, it's the story of the Von Trapp family vampires. I have had this book for like seven years. Um, this book was a gift to me when I was in the hospital after my first child was born, it was a very traumatic hospital experience. A lot of things went wrong and I did not have time to read a book while I was there. There was a lot of like struggle and strife. So this book came home and it sat on my shelf and I never got around to it. And it's been on my shelf for seven years and now we're finally going to read it. The Sound of Music with Vampires. I'm going to read you the description now. The hills are alive with the sound of sucking. Maria von Trapp is sweet, innocent, and can sing like an angel. Oh, and she's also a bloodthirsty vampire. When Maria is kicked out of the zombie-infested abbey where she's been residing for the past 612 years, she's forced to take care of the family von Trapp, a rowdy clan in need of some serious discipline or vampirification. After Maria turns the Von Trapp children into children of the night and marries the Von Trapp patriarch, the family seems destined for eternal, really, really eternal bliss. But the Nazi undeath squads are on the march, intent on ridding Europe of bloodsuckers, and Maria will have to do everything in her power, supernatural or otherwise, to save her vampire brood. I love that it's vampires versus Nazis, not vampire Nazis. Because you see a lot of vampire Nazis, right? But the Nazis being against the vampires and Nazis wanting to exterminate the vampires the same way they exterminated other marginalized groups could be really interesting. Will this book actually be really interesting? I don't have high hopes. I've never read one of these like 
such and such masked up with monsters and like thought it was good but we'll see she's got a nazi's arm in her hand so i'm assuming she's gonna kick some like nazi ass yes uh vampire maria von trapp versus the nazis she's burning something i don't know what she's burning like book burnings yeah yeah they're usually very bad this book i got it seven years ago but it came out in 2012 so it's been around for a while Alan Goldsher is the author of 11 books, including the acclaimed Beatles slash horror slash humor remix novel, Paul is Undead, The British Zombie Invasion. So the Beatles are zombies now. Okay. As a ghostwriter, he has collaborated with numerous celebrities and public figures. Alan lives and writes in Chicago. Sixteen going on seventeen members of our legal team have instructed us to tell you, even though it should be obvious, that my favorite fangs was not prepared, authorized, licensed, approved, or endorsed by any person or entity involved in the creation or the production of Sound of Music film or any version of the stage musical. That seventeenth wouldn't take a call because he was too busy drinking his tea, a drink with jam and bread, to weigh in. Yeah. So we're going to read something funny next time. Because we read funny books sometimes. Um, I had put this book up for a vote previously alongside um, Wuthering Bites and A Vampire Christmas Carol. And The Vampire Christmas Carol won last time. I think it was exactly a year ago. It wasn't Christmas when we read it. Which I was surprised because I thought we were going to say Vampire Christmas Carol for Christmas. But nope. We read it in like October. Um, and now we're back to humor again. It's been a year. So, my favorite things it is. Enjoy. This book is readily available on Amazon or wherever you choose to purchase your books. Don't support Jeff Bezos. He is evil. But, you know, do what you gotta do. Save your money. We're not here to make you spend money. With this book, I encouraged everyone to go support the author and spend money on this book because I think this author really deserves it and her publishing company, who republished this book after the original publication got like dissolved because the company went under and she like lost her book. It was very disappointing and very sad and it was a very good thing that her book like came back to life because that can really tank an author sometimes. Uh, but she's doing good for herself but yeah you should support this author give her money this guy this publishing company not so much oh, bookmarks falling out um i don't know anything about him i'm not going to say anything about him but uh you should be able to find it pretty easily it exists i doubt your library will have it but it exists Anthropomorphic Fiend says, I just finished Wuthering Heights for my class. It's spooky enough sans vampires, TBH, but vampires, though. I really hope that Wuthering Bites would win. Okay. Wuthering Heights, the gothic novel by Emily Bronte. I don't want to say it's my favorite book ever, because obviously The Phantom of the Opera is my favorite book ever, and then Interview with the Vampire and the Vampire Lifts Dead are up there, too. But of my group of favorite books... Wuthering Heights is the best book in that group on a, like, a literary merit level. So if I'm going to be, like, a snob and say, like, my favorite book and also the best book that's ever been written in the history of the English language is Wuthering Heights, it would not be wrong. Wuthering Heights is an excellent book. I know a lot of people turn up their nose at it because all the characters are despicable, awful people. But I'm a person who loves villainous characters. Give me all the villains Please, especially gothic villains. Especially gothic villains in love. That is my jam. Gothic villains in love is where it's at. Wuthering Heights is like the prototype of all of that. The characters written are so complex, so deep, so many layered, nuanced, 
levels to these characters is just like a study of humanity in general a study of like dysfunctional families a study of like people with personality disorders study of just like the way people relate to each other like this is an excellent book excellently written it's got a framing device it's a good book it's one of my favorites Wuthering Heights is like goals um, I really hoped Weathering Bites would win because I want to read that book, but it's on my vampire bookshelf. I got so many books to read. I can't read them all. So, no. People didn't vote for it. Weathering Heights has a bad rap because it is about despicable people. And people like reading about people they like, I guess. You know, I like villains, but, you know, you can't all be me. So my favorite things ones, because who doesn't like Sound of Music? Nazis versus vampires. I hope the vampires eat all the Nazis. From the look of the cover, they do. You know, let's, let's talk about World War II next time. We'll read Wuthering Bites one time. I'll just decree it. I can do that. I have that power. I'm just like, this is the book we're reading this month. You don't have a choice. You know. Oh, Simon Peter Hughes asks me, how are you feeling about the new interview with the Vampire TV series? Looking forward to it? Dreading it? Or both? You know what? I have made my peace with the new interview with the Vampire TV series. You can watch the video on my channel that talks about the whole, like, grieving process the fandom went through as we approached this series. It's not the series we were promised. It's not the series we hoped for. But it's a series that exists. And I have the feeling that the new interview with the Vampire TV series is going to be like when people take Dracula and they're like, what if we did Dracula but? You know, and that's how we got the like NBC version of Dracula. That's how we got Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula. There's like a lot, been a lot of really weird takes on Dracula. They're like, Dracula but. And that's what they're doing with Interview with the Vampire now. They've taken it to that level. What us and the fandom were hoping for was an accurate to book TV series. That's not happening. So we're disappointed. But this other thing that is happening is in that realm of adaptation of a popular property that gets adapted multiple times in multiple different ways and we're already at that point and I think that's kind of cool in a way that like we've already reached that point with the Vampire Chronicles where it's starting to be adapted in a new way and they're like but what if Vampire Chronicles but and you know they're, they've developed this whole new concept for it taking the core elements of the character relationships and putting them in a new world in a new time period in a new like society and exploring that and i'm like okay what if claudia wasn't a child you know now she's like an 18 year old woman with a woman's body you know what if how would that be different i don't know what if it was set in the 1900s instead of the 1700s how would that be different i don't know we'll see and it's just like an au fanfic version and, you know, I've made my peace with the fact that we're not getting what we wanted and I am now excited for what we are getting, even though most of the fandom would disagree with me and I am very entrenched with this fandom. Every single time we have Vampire Book Club, it somehow comes back to Anne Rice. Because you make it come back. I don't bring it up. You do. Oh, Argento's Dracula. <laughs> Why did you have to remind me that exists? Why does he put his daughter in everything? It's creepy and weird. You're reading Queen of the Damned? Good for you, Caroline Carnivorous. Is the book club ever going to have a Phantom of the Upper month or a non-vampire gothic month? I mean, it's the vampire book club, so we're supposed to be reading vampire books. 
We could read Vampires at the Opera, which is Dracula and the Phantom of the Opera are buddies and trying to get their girlfriends back together, but that is a self-published novel and it is hard to find. That book was gifted to me by one of you, thank you very much, um, who had found it somewhere and sent it to me. I'm very appreciative of that. But um, I, it's kind of a hard book to get. It, you know, like I want the book club to be accessible to everyone to be books that you can like find in the world if enough people in the book club were like yeah I'm gonna get it I'm gonna pay $34 to get this book used on eBay then yeah we do it but um as far as Phantom of the Opera goes it's not a fan of the Opera book club though that exists I am a member of that it's on a different discord server not mine this is a vampire book club oh you're almost done with Tale of the Body Thief Anthropomorphic Fiend I am working on a vampire review of that book as sponsored by one of my Patreon patrons coming up imminently in the future, maybe two months from now. Everything is slow in vampire reviews land. All right, this is your chance to share any last thoughts about certain dark things or my favorite fangs are book for next month or if you want to ask me more Anne Rice questions since apparently that's a thing I'm the Anne Rice expert of the internet thank you oh speaking of Anne Rice I am going to the Anne Rice Vampire Lestat fan club ball Halloween ball this Halloween in New Orleans this year I'm not a member of the Empire List the uh, Anne Rice Vampire Lestat fan, fan club I don't know it's, it's fan club you can join I'm not actually a member of that probably should be but I'm not but this club is throwing a ball in New Orleans this Halloween, and I'm going, I'm going to drive my ass down to New Orleans and go to this ball. So if any of you are going to the Anne Rice Vampire Lestat fan club Halloween ball, I will be there. Um, you should come say hi to me. We should hang out. I would very much like that. In New Orleans this Halloween, I know... Uh, COVID restrictions are very high there right now. You have to show your vaccine card and wear a mask the entire time. Be safe. Be secure. Come to the Vampire Ball. Am I going to vlog the Vampire Ball? I'm concerned that that might be disrespectful. Also, I've never really like vlogged thing where like you hold up the cell phone. Like, I don't know, maybe I'll try. I could try, I guess. Um, I mean, I'll have my phone. I got a good camera on my phone. I am a member of a Anne Rice fandom discord server where several other people from the server also go into the ball. So I hope to meet up with these people and, you know, hang out with my friends um, if they're willing. We'll see. I'm assuming it's just going to be like a fun vampire party with a lot of cosplayers. I am not a cosplayer, so I'm just going to like dress in my gothic best and, you know, see and be seen and maybe make some friends. Thank you very much for joining me for the Vampire Book Club. I love talking about vampire books with you. I love all the things you have all said in the Discord group for the Vampire Book Club about this book, um, about other vampire books that we discuss. We sometimes just end up discussing the most random vampire fictional things in the Discord server. It's a vampire-focused Discord server. We, I mean goth focus we'll talk about anything that's like tangentially related to the gothic aesthetic join my discord server hang out with us um there's about like 600 people there but it's not busy 
Like, it's not one of those Discord servers that you can't keep up with. It's like a very chill Discord server. There's no drama there, which, thank you. You guys are awesome. I love it. So join me next month. You have one month to read my favorite fangs. I really wanted Wuthering Bites to win and didn't win. I'm so disappointed. But maybe my favorite fang. You know what? It was a gift to me when I was in the hospital. I should read it. It's about time. We're going to read my favorite fangs. We're going to do it. We're going to have fun. We're going to have humor this month. Join us one month from now. It's always around the 13th, usually on the 13th, unless that doesn't work out. We couldn't meet last night. October 13th. Not only was it my anniversary, but I am taking a class on death. Death. This is the textbook for my class. Death, a graveyard companion, which meets on Wednesday nights. So that's why we couldn't meet last night. If you are not a member of the Vampire D Book Club, Join the Discord. Link is in the server description. You know, you know what I mean. Um, when you join the server, go to the rules section, and if you click the certain emoji that the instructions tell you, then you get the access to the book club channels, which are private for book club members only. Anyone can join. You don't have to actually read the book to join. You can just join and lurk and watch what we say. That is perfectly acceptable. You don't have to do anything. You just have to like click the buttons and you're a member. This book club is sponsored by my Patreon patrons who I don't charge specifically for these book club videos, um, but I charge them for my other videos, which then go in towards funding this book club. So it's like, it's all one big like pool of Patreon awesomeness. So if you would like to help support this book club, Besides just doing the thing where you can give um, donations through the live chat and through the like, what's it called when you like do the money thing in the chat, like super chat, super chat. Um, you could also join my Patreon and that would help support this book club if you are interested in doing that. The link to that is also in the description. And thank you to all my Patreon patrons for being supportive of all our vampire endeavors on the more vampire books we read. Not only do we have more vampire things to talk about, but it gives me reference for when I go and talk about other vampire things, I speak about those vampire properties in my vampire reviews, which the Patreon patrons actually pay for, in context of the vampire knowledge that I've gained through reading these vampire books. It's all research, it's all homework, it all goes into the vampire knowledge pot, which is very important for vampire studies, which I highly support. Thank you for joining me tonight. Read more vampire books. If you have suggestions for what you want to read for next time after My Favorite Fangs, you can give those suggestions in the Vampire Book Club suggestions channel on my Discord server. I am always open to suggestion. If you have vampire books you think you want me to read that you want to give me. Um, people do that sometimes. They send them to my P.O. box. The address for that is also in the description of this video. I get a lot of vampire books at my P.O. box which have helped fill up my vampire shelves. Look at all the vampire books I have. Okay, the way they're arranged is these ones on like this shelf over here are the ones I've read. And these ones on this shelf over here are the ones I haven't read. So. You can see how many more that I still have to read. Yes, you can enter my Discord. The link is in the description of this video. It is an open link. Anyone can enter. Please enter my Discord. But until next time, thank you for joining us. Since we're doing things differently this time, I'm going to figure out how to end the stream. But yes, thank you very much. Vampire Book Club. Read vampire books. Love you. Good night.